Hello, and welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To find future episodes, make sure to subscribe on Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other places where podcasts are found. If you'd like to become a contributing member of the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash media. Every little bit counts, and we appreciate all the support we can get. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the fourth episode of the non Servium podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and today we have Frank Merzel. Oh my God, I don't know how to say your name. Uh, M- Miroslav. Miroslav, as a Frank Miroslav as our guest. Frank is an anarchist from Australia who writes for the Center for a Stateless Society on various topics related to mutualist anarchism, economics, and technology. I've enjoyed reading Frank's articles as well as interacting with them online, and I'm looking forward to diving deeper into some of the provocative ideas they have. With that said, thanks for joining me, Frank, and welcome to the show. Oh, yeah. Now, what's up, mate? What's going on? Just just a fucking Australian can't hear. Uh, (laughs) um, This isn't my accent, but it's um, it's fun to pull it out. Um, (laughs) Before we get into all the the nerdy questions and everything, uh, oh, yeah. I, I got to ask you because I mean, you're the podcast's first international interview. What's oh, it like in sweet. Australia? Yeah, uh, Australia, we're like a couple months away from an election, and um, the so-called Liberal Party is like collapsing in on itself. Um, like um, they had like a fairly centre-right um, leader uh, a couple months ago, and he got like kicked out. Um, because of climate change and there's like there's like this splitting basically in the liberal party um it's like over climate change and like energy policy but like more broadly it's just like social liberals versus like conservatives because the liberal party for some fucking reason is allied with the um the nationalist party who are like basically they i I think they just yeah i think they pretty much just represent like rural areas and farmers and stuff Mm -hmm. um and so that like that's coming home to roost um, but no, it's, it's, it's awesome. Cause, um, so like the, on the federal level, um, like energy policy has been really shit, but like every single state in Australia is, I think we're like New South Wales is the only state that hasn't committed to 50% renewable energy by 2030. Mm-hmm. And, um, they look like they're going to win the next state election. Um, and so that's really exciting cause, um, yeah, um, not dying of climate change, but also like, um, uh, I think, we, and we might go into this later, but like I think that um, the shift to renewable energy or the shift to like decarbonized energy um, also has a lot of like really interesting strategic implications for you know resistance and stuff. Anyway, yeah, that's kind of what what's up with Australia. I interesting. Know, it's like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I mean, it, it sounds like it might not quite be the market communist uh, yeah. utopia yeah, that no. that that you um, might want to live in. <laughs> yeah yeah no um i'm gonna i'm gonna travel up to canberra in a couple of weeks and like destroy you know um scott morrison who's the current prime minister with my facts and logic um, <laughs> it's gonna be like oh shit yeah you're right uh yeah i guess you know you got me if i believe you know that markets are a thing i have to also have to accept communism um, <laughs> so yeah i'm looking forward to that that's gonna rule um but unfortunately australia doesn't have any nukes so we're probably gonna get invaded by like america although we don't have any oil either so you know Damn, yeah. Like, maybe they'll just ignore us. Hmm, I haven't thought about that. No nukes yeah, and yeah. no oil. What are you good for? Yeah, yeah. Um, so seriously, like, Australia's economy, like, um, we didn't we didn't get hit that hard in the financial crisis because we, um, we basically just sold a shit ton of coal to China. Um, and now that's, like, sort of, that's in question now. Uh, um, one thing, one thing that, like, is kind of exciting is, um, long term like people are talking about like um basically turning us into like a hydrogen exporting nation mm-hmm. um because there's like all these asian countries oh, a- a- island asian countries that, like don't have you know they want to decarbonize but they don't have like the you know just space to put renewable energy and they're afraid of nuclear which might not 
actually be that bad if you, you know, if you got it right. But, um, yeah, like they're talking about, you know, like just like fucking, cause we've got all these giant ass deserts, um, a lot like Texas actually, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, if you just like build the, um, utility, if you build like the transmission lines, right. For the energy, mm-hmm. um, you can just access like so much fucking energy. Um, and then you just like turn it into hydrogen and ship it overseas for the Japanese to use. So, but like, yeah, now Australia, like pretty much like everywhere else, it's like in this weird post industrial, like morass of just, you know, like kicking the can down the road, um, you know, uh, yeah. over, overbuilt, like, not overbuilt production but like in like basically like you know there's just like we're desperately like every other post-industrial society like there's just not enough work to go around and so we're just you know creating like make work to get by and right you know it's it's all going to collapse at some point but you know like maybe you know we can like build some solar farms and that'll be cool um, yeah, you know, like that would be like a nice, you know, interesting twist on like the Mad Max formula, where like uh, instead of you know, like it's it's like the same thing, but instead of like you know, gas guzzling cars like driving around the road, desert mm-hmm. shooting each other, like everyone's driving like Teslas, but they've got like you know, crazy <laughs> armor and shit. That'd be so cool. Nice. Okay, so yeah, again, cool. Australia does not seem like the perfect market communist utopia yeah. yet and yeah, by the way yeah. i've seen you identify as that online a market communist uh, and maybe yeah. you're trolling but if you don't mind yeah. me asking is what is yeah, what is market yeah, communism yeah. or is it just mutualism by another name yeah so i don't know um mutualism like if you've ever read prudhomme it's like fucking complicated and you know he's very um yeah he, you know he, he's got a lot of big words and yeah uh, I'm an Australian, so like, I, I think like actually, yeah, I figured out like a couple weeks ago, like I'm actually one one quarter convict, so you know, um, <laughs> that that shit's a little too hard for me. Um, but um, nah, I think um, I think like honestly, like so so free market communism, it's like one thing I've really realized, you know, Kevin Carson, who we'll get to later, but like uh, Kevin Carson, and then like William Gillis's stuff. So really, like. The main thing I'm concerned with is um, collective action problems. I kind of just want to like throw out or at the very least reconsider all of political theory. And I'm not like I'm not super well read. I'm like an amateur. So, you know, maybe I'm overstating this. But like I feel like I feel like really like all of every single political question should just be like really concerned with how do you resolve collective action problems? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like. So you've got like a bunch of people, um, or even more broadly speaking, like you've got a bunch of agents and they all have, you know, conflicting desires. And, um, you've also got to like deal with the fact that like they have, they have to communicate effectively. Um, and that's like a really big problem. So first of all, like the problem is, is like left and right are like really like vague. William Gillis, like his, his article, the emptiness of the left, like is really, really good about this. Like the left is supposedly about equality, but what do you actually mean by equality? And, the right is like about like hierarchy, but also freedom and also like, you know, not being interfered with. And so like, they're not like these fleshed out ideologies. They're just like, you know, these like groupings that s- sustain themselves through, through like momentum. So like, so free market communism is basically, it's a recognition that um, really at the heart of it, it's a recognition that like markets without a commons. And this is something I think, I think you like, you can, like really be as reductionistic as like markets even without like something like reputation it just doesn't work like privatizing everything it just doesn't work there's like this bizarre you get into just bizarre like fairyland where you know like it's it's those dumb like ancap parodies where you know like you have to like fucking like pay to use like a pavement or something it's it's absurd but yeah like, so even even stuff like positive externalities like reputation um so i think one example i'd use is something like the silk road that was that website which unfortunately got shut down but it was right. like you know um people would use like bitcoin to buy uh, like drugs and stuff and right. um they like the way it worked was like it had a reputation system because you know they couldn't like it's it's fucking illegal so like mm-hmm. you can't enforce it so the way they enforced it was um they use reputation and from what i've seen it works quite well 
and that and that's like that's like a positive externality um, that you know can't really be captured and becomes like part of this common and in a way it's like very communistic um, because this is like information that you know no one can really own and um, potentially like the utility of it is incredibly high um, you know if an individual like privatized that information and only they had access to it um, it would be very low va- value but if like everyone had access to it like the potential value from it is like really really massive I'm not even talking financially like I bet there's like sociologists out there and economists who'd be like really really who would do some really fascinating stuff like by like analyzing you know just reputation um, systems on these um, platforms um, and so yeah it's so that that's like you know the most obvious example but you know there's like there's like other stuff like um I think I think the notion of like the notion of like efficient markets mm-hmm. like efficient markets like they require like institute like so you've got like you know this perfect abstract theory of what a market is and like in that theory it works like really well and then in reality when the rubber hits the road you know there's like all these problems and I think actually um I think Joseph Stiglitz has written some good stuff even though he's like a left liberal but like I think he's written some really good stuff on like you know problems of information asymmetry and then there's also problems with information processing. Um, those problems don't really go away, even if you know we all like put computers in our head, just because you know there are like limits to like what like even supercomputers can process in terms of information. And so, you know, I'm not gonna like <laughs> I'm not gonna say like you know write out policy prescriptions for how a transhuman market will work, but like you know it is hypothetical that you know even in such a future where like you know everyone was like incredibly rational like you'd still need institutions to you know deal with problems around information asymmetry or like you know negative externalities and stuff like that the problem is like privatizing that sort of stuff like it can work but at the same time it's it's like really difficult and you get into weird incentive stuff and also you know at a certain point it's like like why even bother like why not just you know like do it as like do it as like a non-profit thing um yeah. So, it, it, and also, and also, finally, um, and this is like my really, really like meme thing that I'm, I, I haven't, I haven't told anyone, but like, you know, maybe I'll unleash this to like totally destroy some dumb shit liberals. But like, so there's this thing called the efficient market hypothesis, and mm-hmm. I might be getting this wrong. Um, I, I read it, I read about it a couple of days ago, and like, I was kind of out of it when I read it. But like, the efficient market hypothesis is basically, um, it's like this is the state of the market when like you know everyone has perfect information and like perfect processing capacities and um if you know anything about arguments about like you know um like the knowledge problem or the calculation problem of like the 20th century you know like those things are like really impossible and if like they did kind of exist like economics becomes really weird and so my my like sort of trolley answer is is like as you approach like an efficient market um, and also, you know, just because like shit like automation becomes like, you're like, you're like, yeah, you can't really like have an efficient market without automation, but it's like you approach an efficient market where like suddenly like, you know, everyone's like super smart and super rational. And it's like, why not, you know, just like do communism then? <laughs> like why, <laughs> why bother with like, you know, prices and shit if like everyone's super smart and like you can send like perfect information, like I, I like the way I can see prices and like the reason they're useful is like they compress, you know, all this like complex information into this, you know, simple signal. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, you can make assessments based on that. And when you don't need to do that anymore, do you actually need prices? Um, and, you know, maybe I'm getting it wrong. I'm okay. sure like someone who actually understands mathematics will yell at me after this. But the fucking, the like sort of corporatist shift after World War II and also during to like massive corporations um, and mm-hmm. the sort of just what was required in terms of like social organization and like training of people um, and like the ideas that came along with that. I think, I think it's really given us a distorted view of what left and right are. Um, and I think, I think mean, that's like, there's something I could dedicate my little life to, or at the very least, like the next decade, it would be like trying to really undo those things. Cause I think, um, I think there's like a lot there. The mutualists or some mutualists that I've interacted with and some of the mutualist material that I've that I've read and mm. listened to claims that with perfect competition you would see prices go down to almost zero. Yeah. And as you said yeah, earlier, so yeah. prices are a great way of discovering wants and needs of people mm. in a condensed mm. sort of form of knowledge mm. or whatever. 
So yeah. if you get rid of the the price signal, how is it that we are able to communicate wants and needs? Yeah, that so that like gets into really fucking weird territory. So there's a book by this guy called Jeremy Rifkin, who's like this sort of progressive, but also like pretty ambitious compared to other progressives uh, called the Zero Marginal Cost Society, in which he basically argues like, he, he, like he, it's really, really funny because um, he's like basically making like the Marxist argument that, you know, uh, contradictions of capitalism will like tear them, tear itself apart. And, um, you know, he's like pointing, pointing to these, you know, various emerging technologies that will do this. And it's really funny because, you know, this is something that actual fucking Marxists should have gotten onto. But, you know, it took this like, you know, guy who advises for like China and the EU <laughs> to do, um, which is really funny. But so the way I think I would, I, yeah. So post-scarcity is like this weird thing where like our assumptions about economics kind of go out the window. I still think though that like, there's like different degrees of post-scarcity, I guess I'll say. Um, and th- yeah, so one idea I've had is that, um, and this is actually based off Rifkin's book, is um, so one thing he points out is like um, renewable energy produces mm-hmm. um, electricity at a basically a zero marginal cost. So once you've got a solar panel set up, it'll just produce you electricity and you like, you know, the only, the only like price you have to pay is like maintenance costs. I, I, I need to like, you know, actually sit this, sit down and like think this out. But I feel like what might happen is like you would get a sort of basic income, but um, it would be expressed in something like electricity. So the the logic is, is that automated systems, you know, they require no human labor. And so you don't like unless, you know, you've got like um, – imposed costs via um, state interference, which is probably likely to happen. But, uh, you know, you can just like, that you have this electricity budget like every month or whatever that you get because, you know, you've just, um, you just like constantly, you know, getting free energy from the sun. Um, and so, so that, that isn't a price. Mm-hmm. That, that isn't like money you're sending. It's like um, just energy because like the entire thing is automated. And so... Um, this is like stuff we have to think about and, um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, but like, I, like, you know, like, I don't know, like you just ask like any ANCOM and they'll be like, yeah, like, you know, like people aren't going to stop like doing weird and interesting shit. And in fact, it's more likely that more weird and interesting shit will happen. Like once we, like, as we start approaching that point, it seems also that maybe with like a decrease in, prices mm. maybe there is maybe you don't have the ability to discover like wants and needs mm. as easily but with mm. like sufficient technology that allows you to fulfill those wants and needs you can sort of like it not be so dependent on the cash nexus in other words yeah and, i like i i i just don't like you know i just don't see that going away and i and you know this isn't like me dealing with this like you know, like liberal economists and like conservative economists are freaking out about this sort of thing. And I think there's like a lot of incoherence there, but you know, it it means I'm not alone, I guess, Mm -hmm. Um, which is good. Sure. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about the article that you recently wrote for Uh, C4SS that hasn't came out yet. Um, mm. but you secretly leaked it to me and, um, uh, <laughs> just before the interview, I was, I was, I was skimming through it. I didn't quite finish it, mm. but you wrote a review of Joanna Bachman's book markets in mm. the name of socialism. I wanted to ask yeah. you, why did you decide to review this book in particular and what was your takeaway from it? No, so, so Bachman's amazing. Like she's, she's done, first of all, I just want to like give her props for, um, like her scholarship. So like she, um, she was like living in, I think like Eastern Europe in like the nineties. Yeah. She was talking to like all these Eastern European economists who were like socialists who were no, like libertarian socialists of like varying degrees. So like some were like, oh, you know, we'll have a state that, you know, like we're going to put a lot of more, more stuff in like, you know, cooperatives and commons and stuff like that and then some were like actual just you know like yeah you know like market socialism you know and a state that's like ludicrous so hmm. let's just get rid of that and do some markets um yeah um she wrote a fantastic book that's yeah basically just a history of neoclassical economics um and like the fact that there has been throughout it this sort of like really explicitly libertarian socialist current throughout it um and the fact that like 
both the USSR and the United States and, you know, European countries allied to both sides, they both like really tried to suppress it. Yeah, it, it really, really just reshapes, uh, you know, your conception of um, left versus right, as I was talking about. Yeah, she, she, what she does is she um, basically shows that just throughout the history of neoclassical economics, like again and again, like socialism and all its various definitions just really plays an influence that, you know, nobody, nobody acknowledges today. Um, so the most, the most like obvious example is um, Leon Walrus, who um, was one of the key figures of the marginalist revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, which is like where neoclassical com- e- economics came from, um, was both like, was, you know, an outward socialist and, you know, just saw no, no contradiction between like the like desires of socialism and also market competition. Mm-hmm. But like even beyond that, many, many like pro-market economists, no, many pro-capitalist economists also use the idea of a socialist um, state to articulate like how value would be arrived at so like they obviously weren't in favor of it but they used it as sort of this um way to theorize about how prices would be formed um so like you have um i'm gonna pronounce this wrong but uh petreo that italian dude in in articulating how prices were formed he um he like described something very very like close to sort of um the socialism of um like Oscar Lange, who was um, like an outwardly state socialist guy, like kind of like one of the important figures um, in this economic calculation debate. So, you know, neoclassical economics and socialism like are very related. And um, what she shows though is like there's like the like World War II and sort of the rise of the um, Cold War, like mm-hmm. really sort of disrupted this line of thought because you know so in the 30s like many they're like they're like a, a, a number like there were like a notable amount of economists who were like yeah like neoclassical economics and socialism like that's just you know logical um fits together perfectly um although bachman doesn't like actually cite like numbers she just like cites you know people being like yeah like this is you know um, the feeling in the air, like this is like what mm. people fought at the time. But then um, World War II happened, and what happened, what that resulted in was um, the emergence. First of all, it, you know, the Red Scare made it so that, you know, anyone who was like, oh, you know, like neoclassical economics and socialism, they go together. Um, you know, they're like, oh, you know, you're obviously like a commie sympathizer. So, that, like, you know, you better cut that shit out. We're gonna- that's interesting. That was, I found that extremely yeah, interesting yeah. when i was reading your article that's that that might be the shift away from people identifying or associating free markets with socialism yeah um yeah i don't i don't know i think um i think it's still like incomplete but yeah like i f- i feel like that's definitely like a turning point mm-hmm. um but like i again like i don't know because you know like she doesn't mention any um non neoclassical um socialists and so, you know, like stuff like um, earlier crackdowns on um, libertarians and anarchists in mm-hmm. like the United States might might have had something to do with that. Like, yeah, I, I like I, I still think it's an incomplete history, but like Bachman definitely shows that there was like something there, and yeah. like it got seriously um, derailed. Yeah. So one of part part one was the Red Scare, but the um, second part was also the fact that um, tech, they needed like technocratic managers to manage the economy. Because, you know, if you know anything about, like, <laughs> like basically, like, post-World War II, like, you know, there were considerable similarities between um, uh, Soviet Russia and the United States just in terms of, like, how corporations um, were structured. Yeah. And so, like, they both just required, you know, this apparatus of um, technocratic management. And um, neoclassical economics was kind of just used as this, um, it was like seen as this way to like, you know, basically plan these giant organizations. And, you know, basically it was used as a way to like figure out like what prices were and like what inputs should be used um, and stuff like that. And so 
what that resulted in is this desire for like um actionable like stuff so basically just here is you know this like engineering schematic that you can use to like manage this giant organization Mm -hmm. and like you know here's how you collect data and stuff like that and so questions around um political economy and you know like how power is distributed or even like you know what institutions made up um society got kind of brushed to the wayside both in the um united states and in russia um two examples she gives um one is kenneth arrow who like articulated this critique of top-down planning in this article social choice and individual values but he didn't like this very like abstract mathematical way um because he was afraid of like repri- reprisal and censorship um and then also leonid Kent- kantorovich who mm-hmm. um uh was the guy who came up with linear programming and like one of like he's, he's like a big deal computer scientist guy who um you know kind of articulated a way that you could like overcome the calculation problem and like actually tried to figure that out um the book read plenty um he's a like main character in that and what that's were, a pretty good book what were his thoughts how did how did what did he propose uh, as a way to um, get around the calculation oh problem? i i i like he basically it was it was a way to like figure out like the optimal output of various inputs and like how you could calculate that i think but yeah Hmm. it's been a while since i read that sort of stuff anyway my point is not that like he tried to solve that but it was more that he also was like really he also like had institutional critiques but um he couldn't like express them he was in this bind where like he was you know doing this like technocratic work for the soviet government to like try and you know make their economy work but at the same time he also had these critiques where he was like like the, the the problem isn't you know that you don't have enough computational power or anything it's that you know the institutions themselves and like the way like power works within society that's like that's what's causing the problems but of course he wouldn't say that because you know the fucking soviet union right mm-hmm. interesting so I, I yeah i didn't get to the end of of your article, but what was mm. the, what was the big takeaway from it? What, what was it that, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was your, yeah, your so, feeling in general about the book? Yeah. So, um, I don't think she realized this at the time, but like, she basically were like, you know, like the market anarchist or left libertarian or whatever, mm-hmm. um, like history. And like, it really, you know, it really just like solidified what, like how I feel about things and, you know, like, so I think, I think one problem with um, the sort of C4SS milieu is like, we, we just don't have like enough eyeballs on like stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, like, I, I, we've got some like really, really sharp critiques, but um, you know, we just don't have enough like people, you know, thinking and like reading stuff uh, to like see where stuff falls apart, which, you know, like it's fine. Like, like, so like everyone I think doing politics right now is in that sort of position. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're certainly like a hell of a lot better than, you know, like, I don't know, like left accelerationists or like the alt right or anything. Like, I think, I mean, we're like miles ahead of them, but you know, there's like still a lot of work we could do. Um, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, one thing I got from that is just like, you know, if you sort of like, I guess, like, there was nothing, there was nothing in Bachman's book that, like, surprised me, which, which was good. Like, a, you know, if you describe, like, the situations and then, you know, not the conclusion and you asked me to guess the conclusion, um, I think I would have got, I, I think I would have had a pretty good, I think I would have done a pretty good job out of it. Uh, so one, one thing that, one thing that's like really interesting is she touches on the, um, the fall of the, um, Soviet bloc and how like the transition from socialism to capitalism occurred. And mm. it's like, holy fucking shit. Like, you know, every sort of assumption, um, you know, that, you know, you'd make about that actually happened. So like, I think, I think one thing that surprised me was that actually though, um, was that, so there were like, there were economists who were like pushing for market reforms and were pushing for a decentralization mm-hmm. um, within countries like Hungary and Yugoslavia. And what happened is like, they would get some reforms, but um, it would be in ways that were like self-serving to the elites. And then, you know, you'd end up with like, oh, you know, you get like markets and like decentralized firms, but then, you know, like the workers actually don't have any agency mm-hmm. and control. And then they're all just contracted to the state. And so like, there's like barely any difference. And then, you know, like the workers 
like, you know, get pissed off about this and then they like rise up, they undo those reforms. And that was like a cycle in both countries um, where, you know, you get some sort of pro decentralization and pro autonomy reforms. And then like they wouldn't be implemented properly and they'd be self-serving and then they get rolled back because workers would get pissed off. And so like what ended up happening is like the decentralist economists were like, okay, you know, what we've got to do is we're going to do it all in one like fell swoop. And we're, you know, we're going to ha- make this happen all at once. And we, we don't want to like deal with this, you know, back and forward, back and forward. And what ended up happening though, is when the um, Berlin Wall, Wall fell and like, you know, these countries were supposedly liberalized. Um, this was used as like a justification for like Bachmann explicitly states that like, it was like Stalinist imposition of capitalism onto these countries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, ob- like obviously like, you know, um, what ended up happening is like, like the people managing the transition were like, oh, you know, obviously workers can't manage themselves. Like, you know, we're going to give this to like, you know, bankers or political elites. Those are the people who are going to be in control. Yeah. Um, and the funniest thing, the funniest thing was um, that the economists who found it easiest to transition from um, one system to the other were those who were like deeply involved with um, planning the economy which is hilarious and, like, also, you know, miserable. I, I feel like, you know, market anarchist theory, like, you know, if you ask people how, how stuff would, you know, um, if, you like, you're going to try and predict how things would play out, like, I think um, uh, our analysis would, um, would, like, lead you to those conclusions. And so, yeah, it was, it was like, you know, it was kind of, like amusing and also like you know incredibly depressing um to see this happen i like even if you know even if we got like decentralist market hungry like i don't think it would have gone all that great um you know you're, you're operating you know within like the eu and you have to deal with organize organizations like the imf and um like the world bank and stuff um so you know i think there would be a limit to what you could do but i think um you know, uh, at the same time, like, I think one thing Market Anarchist Fury suggests is, um, like, our current system of worker organization is just incredibly inefficient. And so, you know, I think at the very least, it would have been, you know, I think, I mean, it just would have been, like, really helpful for the left in general to, you know, like, who know who knows if this would have happened, but, like, you know, a sort of more decentralized attempt at market socialism where like, you know, this sort of backwards Eastern European country, um, you know, suddenly like starts doing really well because, you know, they actually like, you know, give workers autonomy and stuff like that. I think that would have helped like the left sort of not get so lost after, um, what, what, after the Cold War ended. Um, okay. Well, earlier, just to change subjects a little bit, you mentioned the alt, right? And yeah. I've, I've seen you tweet about neo-reactionaries before. Oh, yeah. And what, yeah, what no. do you, what's your take on folks like Nick Land and the NRX universe in general? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is so actually, I didn't, I didn't put this in the article, but I think, um, I think, I think Markets in the Name of Socialism is actually like the most comprehensive rebuttal to Nick Land, both in the 90s and in like, and today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, Nick Land, like he fell for the neoliberalism meme, man. Sucks to be him. Um Wait, wait, what do you what no. do you mean by that? So like Nick Land was like, well, you know, who knows how much he's trolling, um, but like his kind of assumption was at the end of the ni- at like the nineties, you know, when he's writing like probably his best work. I, I guess yeah, I, I guess in terms of like interestingness and like, you know, ooh, this is like fun to read, but mm-hmm. I don't really actually think there's much in there. But like, you know, he kind of, assu- like, he kind of like assumed like, you know, neoliberalism, like that capitalism really had one and, you know, that like, yeah, like we're just going to be doing innovation and disruption and it's going to like, rule. um, and you know, like we're going to get like robots and shit. It's going to like be <laughs> fucking awesome. Um, yeah. Like, you know, I'm going to jump on this train and then, you know, like pff, that didn't fucking happen. <laughs> um, yeah. <coughs> And so, so he's better about this than like other like near reactionaries, but like, you know, he's just like, yeah, like, you know, like markets, it just like makes shit happen. And it's like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to completely ignore, you know, questions about like, you know, oh, you know, like, do you need like people to have like freedom 
um, to like think and like, you know, freedom, like spare time, just to, like do random shit and like, you know, try stuff out. Um, and I think, I think admittedly he has gotten sort of better about this. His sort of turn to like patchwork, although, you know, that's super problematic, but, um, I think, I think he's like, you know, he's like, again, like his, like his corpus is like massive and I don't want to like read through all his blog posts where like, you know, a quarter of them are like, oh yeah, you know, like we really need to like, you know, get high IQ like Asians into the, our country. That's a problem. Um, right. but like, I think, I think he's like sort of, you know, like, um, I remember like uh, an interview of him a couple of years ago where he's like, Oh, you know, like I don't, I don't like, you know, big like failures, like on like the scale of nation states, it's like scary and bad, but, like small localized failures is like good, which, you know, I think is like actually completely compatible with what, what I believe. But, you know, like, you know, like his obsession with like IQ and shit, and, like whatever, like, you know, like the fastest way to like, you know, an intelligence takeoff or whatever, or like really, or like even just like really cool technical shit is just, you know, like, you know, abolish intellectual property and, you know, like give basic needs infrastructure to like everyone. Cause you know, like trying to like fuck around with like eugenics and like, you know, get like people in Singapore to breed cause they're high IQ or something. It's like, whatever, you know, just like, you know, give like food to people and like, you know, mobile phones and like, you know, so they're not like in poverty and like dying. Um, and then, you know, like, even if like one in a billion of them is Einstein, you know, that's like six or seven Einstein. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure you are familiar with Curtis Yarvin then. Yeah. No. Oh, so Curtis Yarvin is actually like, he, he's like actually like fucking hilarious. Yeah. So Nick Land, like Nick Land actually makes sense. He's like, yeah, you know, like I actually don't give a shit about like your traditionalism. I just like, you know, want like cool technology, which, you know, like, I think, kind of true, like, though. Kind of true, though. And and I read the only book I read by Nick Land was The Dark Enlightenment, and he seemed to mm. like Curtis Yarvin, his yeah. his his uh, pseudonym Mencius Molebug. Mm. He like hides this this like undertone of like markets are cool and shit, but also we should have a whites only society. It's yeah. it seems to me just be a. a to be a cover, a means to an end mm. that that end yeah. is a whites only society. And it, yeah, I, so I don't, I actually, I, I, first of all, like, I don't know. I, I think Curtis is like a fucking idiot. Um, and you can quote me on that. Amen. But, um, Amen. So, but like, so the, the fucking problem is, so, um, he like, he's, he's, he's like, so my ethical system, Curtis is says is like, my ethical system is that order is good and chaos is bad which, you know, is really, really fucking stupid. Um, like, that, so that, like, you know, like, second law of thermodynamics, so, like, good luck. Um, being, like, I like, I like order, but I also, you know, want governments to, like, operate on, like, a blockchain market. Like, maybe some of the most galaxy brain shit in the world. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's fucking amazing. Um, and again, that's that's why, like, I think actually Nick Land is like the most coherent of the neo reactionaries because it's like his essay, his Dark Enlightenment stuff. Um, so the final one, um, I think it's four F. It's the Dark Enlightenment. It's like free parts. It's like how democracy's fucked and like you know why we all need to like do you know techno libertarian um, like city states, whatever. And then like the remainder is like dedicated to like talking about racism. You know, race and like you know eugenics and stuff and then mm. the final one is like is him being like oh um guess what biotechnology is a thing um you know if you want to like get high iq people like why are you fucking around with this race stuff just like genetically engineer yourself right. um and then <laughs> and then yeah it's really 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 funny because he's like talking about like white nationalist anxiety mm-hmm. um and then and he's like yeah like you know like fucking biotechnology is going to come along and you guys are kind of fucked. Yeah. Um, there's this book, um, called near reaction of basilisk, um, by Elizabeth Sandifer, um, which like is sort of this analysis of near reaction and like the broader sort of surrounding like influences on it. Um, done by this, literary like, done by someone who's like got a degree in literature um and i think in some places is like a little too pretentious 
And it's a fairly decent takedown of um, Yavin um, and also Yud- Yudkowski, who's like this whole other thing that I won't get into. But um, I'm not even like familiar sort of, with him. Uh, it's like it's like the less wrong stuff, and it's I, I don't know. It's like eh, whatever. But um, like her her like her like attempt to like take down Nick Land isn't like as um like it's not as strong as like her attempts to, like take down Yavin. Um, because like Nick Land, like, you know, I don't know. Um, I'll let William Gillis fight him cause you know, <laughs> he's, he's like actually operating on that level, but I'm not, but yeah, like Sandifer completely misses the fact that like, you know, um, cause she's a Marxist and for, you know, better or worse. And so she completely misses the fact that, you know, like these guys want like perfect order, but at the same time they also, you know, want the market because they, they, they see that. I think, I think it's like, for them it's it's twofold it's like if they're being honest it's like they see it as a way to like enact eugenics um and have like a moral justification for it and then also they see it as a way to like measure meritocracy um which if if you don't mind i'd actually like to go into because I, I think i think like, like that is really where like our current conception of left and right i i think like that right there is like why the left dislikes markets so much and also like why there's this bizarre alliance on the right of like you know, um, religious traditionalists and also like, you know, um, cosmopolitan libertarians. Yeah. So on the subject of like the left and the right and their relation to like markets, um, and like why the left doesn't like it and why the right, you know, paradoxically like likes it despite the fact that, you know, at the very least like conservatives. So conservatives, it seems, um, and I think the most uh, the most prominent example of this is um, Tucker Carlson, mm-hmm. who you know is this kind of dipshit. Well, he's not a dipshit. He's probably actually quite intelligent, but he acts like a dipshit. Um, <laughs> Fox News host, who um, recently like came out talking about how you know, oh, you know, like we need to like get governments involved to like protect the traditional family, and you know, like we got to like restrict capitalism to you know protect the family and shit like that. And so, and, and like more broadly, like, um, I think like the sort of alliance of like capital and conservatism, uh, it seems is like starting to unfold. And I think, I think that's for two reasons. Well, so obviously there's the cultural aspect. Um, so Daniel Bell, who he wrote this like really good book, well, really good essay called the cultural contradictions of capitalism, which basically states that there's like two contradictory um cultural forces that are required for capitalism to exist um there's this sort of disciplined like side which you know is really obvious um everyone knows about that there's also like the consumptive side the hedonistic side like you know capitalism can't function without people actually buying the shit that you make and so more and more you know like traditional family values or whatever are getting eroded by that second force Um, and you know, it's becoming, and also, and also, um, sort of, you know, the requirements of like, of like being competitive in the age of globalization and like immigration and stuff like that just means that, um, it's no longer assumed that like the conservative assumption about who like, you know, the average person is like, you know, the straight white man with a family, um, that's no longer the case. Um, and so, you know, you can see that about like people freaking out about, you know, like, like brands, you know, like signaling that, you know, Oh, you know, maybe you shouldn't like beat up your wife or whatever. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's something. But then also I think, um, when this goes back to what you were saying about, um, like the near reactionaries and like, you know, the fact that they supposedly like markets, but they don't like competition. Um, I think also part of it is just like, I think, there's not like anyone in the West who hasn't dealt with like ca- like markets as you know this corporate massive corporate form. Um, you know this is going all the way back to like the Gilded Age, where you know like uh, like the main market forces, especially in America, were like you know these massive corporations, you know that were very structured, um, and you know they had all this influence. And so I think, I think, I think also part of it is like the fact that, you know, neoliberalism, despite the fact, you know, it's obviously shit in a whole lot of ways. Um, one thing that it has done, I want to say is that 
it has given like more people of like a diverse of like a more diverse background like more opportunities to do stuff um even though you know it's obviously like inadequate in a whole bunch of ways and obviously has all these problems so like women entering the workforce for one thing like that you know obviously like it sucks in a whole bunch of ways but like it does give women more autonomy um and you know it has also been responsible for um like feminism getting like like popularized because you know women come into workplaces and like they have to deal with crap and so then like you know suddenly feminism like is a lot more appealing because um um they like come into the like they have to deal with like you know more bullshit and you know like stuff like transgender women you know like maybe getting like uh like decent jobs or something um you know like this assumption implicit assumption that like white men uh, are like the best and so we can have a meritocracy because we'll always win like that's starting to you know unravel even though obviously there's a shitload more that w- that could be done and I, I think also part of it is um the um like developing countries um are starting to catch up and so like back in the day like capitalism ruled because you know it was kind of um, it kind of happened like, you know, at the point of a gun, you know, like, like naval powers like England and the United States could sort of dictate terms. And that's less and less possible because um, countries around the world, like, are, you know, slightly stronger, even though, you know, there are still like some pretty shitty trade deals today. But I guess back in the day, like capitalism was like seen as a way to conserve like hierarchies and values um because just everyone else economically was so much weaker um and also militarily and that's starting to come undone and so i think that's why that's why like this this sort of alliance between you know conservatism and um uh capitalism it's like starting to come undone Uh, and then there's also the fact that you know like the corporate form was um you know in like it's it's only possible via massive state intervention um Mm -hmm. Yeah. Expanding um, on that a little bit, it also helped shape the family, right? Mm, yeah, 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 no. Yeah. The like, nuclear yeah, family the nuclear specifically. Family. Yeah, the nuclear family, um, I can't remember who says this, but um Kevin Carson mentions it in one of his um uh, art in one of his books is like the nuclear family emerged because it was like the minimum viable unit for like because people like constantly had to move around to like you know get jobs and stuff and so it was like the smallest it was like this really small like compact unit that could like easily be moved around Mm -hmm. and then it was it's only like you know post-world war ii with you know massive like um government spending on shit like you know like suburbs and highways and stuff that you know the supposed natural way of things uh, emerged and then you know of course that couldn't last for a variety variety of reasons and now you know like suburbs are dead and um the way i think about it is like that happened because you know like a massive amount of energy was used to was used to like create something that um you know just didn't ha- just didn't return that didn't have a return on that energy and um once you know um keynesianism sort of ran out and you could no longer like afford to do upkeep on this like you know way of living it kind of collapsed and like yeah like all these like all these social ills have come out of it um that like i won't go into but you know if you're familiar with like american politics at all you know you'll probably have read some analysis on what happened what's happening and what has happened yeah so you were talking about why the left in general is hostile towards markets i don't know if you touched on that exactly yeah yeah so um it's weird it's really weird i think i i think i think more broadly speaking it's um kind of the left has remained um unfortunately like very stuck in an industrial era mindset where you know the assumptions about uh you know like economies of scale and like organization yeah have like just really remain uh, oh yeah and like individual capacity have really remained stuck in an industrial era mindset although you know that's obviously not true for everyone but um you know like you talk to you know like <laughs> They're like, they're like, you know, I, I'm sure like me an Australian, you know, I have no idea, but, um, I'm sure like if you were to talk to like 
people like the DSA and be like, oh, you know, like what's the best way to, you know, like get what you want. Um, I think, you know, they'd probably suggest some form of mass organization be that, you know, like we need to get people to vote or, you know, like we need to, you know, do like mass strikes or, you know, even God forbid, like take up arms against the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And so I, I think, I think like really like questions about like organizational efficiency and like also just like capacity of individuals, um, like questions around that have really like not been addressed broadly on the left. Thankfully, they've been addressed on the post left, which um, again, William Gillis has written some really good stuff on this. And I, I like I, I think um, I mean I think so. Part of the reason they hate market, well, they distrust markets, is um, like these qu- like questions about um, organizational efficiency. Once you start like looking into that you know, you start talking about stuff like information flows, information processing and stuff like that, like markets, like it's really, really hard to avoid, um, questions of markets. Um, like you can, like, I think there's like technology hacks where, you know, you can like build apps that, you know, make it so that you can have meetings more effectively and stuff like that. But like at a certain point, it becomes really hard to ignore the fact that, you know, autonomous action just, there's just so much that um, so much more that you can just do with autonomous action that like collective um, decision making just like ignore like makes it so so difficult to do. Um, yeah. So again, again, like this goes back to the question of collective action problems, and I think um, the left like really, really doesn't doesn't really get collective action problems. Mm-hmm. Um, the right doesn't get it either. But the, like the way I'd put it is like. Pretty much everyone nowadays like has no fucking idea what's going on, especially with regards to collective action problems. It's just that like the right can kind of get away with it because like they don't need to. Um, like their end goal isn't one where like they want individual agency and autonomy, mm-hmm. um, and they are to a large degree, even though they don't see it this way, they are to a large degree like defending what already exists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they don't need to think about this sort of thing. And also like, they just have more resources. And so, you know, they can make up for like, you know, shitty coordination by just, you know, being able to like field more people or have more money. Whereas like the left, you know, like back in the day, it was like, oh, you know, we've just got more bodies and like that'll work out. Um, but nowadays <laughs> like that's not so true. And also like, even if it was like organizational efficiency and, you know, like just, having that like force multiplier of being able to coordinate more effectively, like that's still something you'd want either way. Go, so going back to like markets, like, you know, the left, the way, like the way the left kind of just assumes that, you know, like big corporations exist because like they can do shit more better. And so, you know, like that's just the way it is. And, you know, like we're going to do democracy and we're going to like vote or like elect someone. And that's all really dumb. And, and it's just, you know, this very shallow analysis. Um, and it like, I think um, I get into this in the article, like, I think it really just comes out of, you know, like, you know, we got infected, like the left got infected with Marxism and they're like, well, you know, can't, can't like look into economics because like if you look into economics, like it'll make you a sociopath. And so, you know, we're just not going to bother with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, the like right and the center like got really, really lazy. And so, you know, it's just this giant clusterfuck that. um, Right. I was just going to say, uh, it seems like the the left in general sort of uses these old left economic analysis of yeah. of the way like corporate domination comes about. Mm. They see it as yeah. basically like a product of laissez-faire, or a product of <laughs> yeah, perfect competition yeah. as opposed to like systematic privileging of certain firms yeah, yeah, within yeah, industry. Yeah, it's really dumb. And, it's so um, dumb. It just seems really outdated. Yep. And I, I to me, like that pointing that out can't be stressed enough and without yeah, that yeah. your analysis is shit honestly yeah like yeah, if we're talking about like, corporate domination and not highlighting the ways in which yeah. they have privileged systematically to to have that place of dominance yeah then yeah. what does it matter and also and also like it just it just like leads to like some really like shitty like strategy um so one thing one thing i'm actually like starting to get interested in is um so questions around like, um, like automation, 
<laughs> yeah, you. I, I've like tweeted about this, like so, like liberal like think tanks are like just blindsided by this. Um, I watched this video of um, Andrew Yang, who's like this sort of Silicon Valley guy who's running for president in 2020. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, my friend Eric Weinstein was like, oh my god, like you know, capitalism is just like birthing technology and it's eating itself. And like, who could have ever predicted this? I'm like, holy fucking shit, have you never read like? God? <laughs> Like this is like that's like Marxism one hundred and one. <laughs> um, it's it's like like so like the mainstream is like they're like automation is going to kill all these jobs and then you know oh my god that's going to be horrifying and, you know we've got to educate everyone and and all the like you know basic income and then I don't know like something will happen mm-hmm. um, and so I I think actually like the left like here has um, actually like far more leverage than they think just because mm-hmm. like liberals just don't fucking know what's going on but like again going back to the industrial like era mindset it's like this bizarre thing where they're like all right so like all the jobs are going to be automated and they're going to use these algorithms and it's just going to like fit perfectly into this industrial era like um way of doing things where like you know you like go to a google server and then you have to like pay some money to like you know get them to i don't know like do automation things and i'm like <laughs> where is you know the analysis of the fact that like all this is intellectual property which is really really hard to like you know right. like privatize um or like, you know, where's the analysis of the fact that, you know, me and my like hacker friends can like write up an algorithm for like, you know, a drone delivering parcels or something and then, you know, publish that on publish that online and then, you know, it can be copied by everyone. Um, I, I, I made a I made like a joke tweet, like, you know, we should like be training, you know, people who are gonna be like unemployed by robots to become hackers to like steal intellectual property from these like corporations. Nice. Because like you don't you don't need to like seize the factories anymore. Right. <laughs> like you That's know, the old you testament. Have, like, yeah. It's it's just like like <laughs> like our notion of class struggle is like it, it's just like what? <laughs> like and, and then even like you know robots like make make shit it's like you know um they're not like ah oh, gee i i i i'm i'm probably gonna get shit for this um because i'm gonna be wrong but like you know kevin carson like in homebrew industrial revolution showed that like you know um although he doesn't call them robots but he's like yeah you know like automated tools to make stuff like are getting really really cheap and, you know, like, oh, you know, maybe we won't be able to, you know, make, like, really high-end, like, complicated, like, you know, nanofibers or whatever. But, like, there's just, like, a lot of stuff that we could just, you know, like, move production um, in, like, we just move production um, uh, by, like, just, you know, taking, like, relatively cheap productive equipment um, and just making shit ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, like, nobody's aware of this <laughs> right <laughs> and it's, it's like what mm-hmm. um yeah so i'm 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 really interested in that um and it just it just completely upends everyone's assumptions about everything it is it is absolutely fucking bananas all right so we were talking about the ways in which corporate domination exists through direct and indirect mm-hmm. privileges granted to certain firms mm-hmm. in the market systematically stamping out competition blah 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 yeah also you can go back historically to the mm-hmm. enclosure of the commons and everything oh yeah but i wanted to ask you what's the correct way to approach the historical plunder and ill-gotten gains to which corporate capitalists have been the beneficiaries do you think progressive taxation or Maybe something like counter economics can be a redistributive mm. mechanism in uh, yeah in that sort of way. I mean, like progressive taxation. Um, I don't know. I, I I just you know like the only way I see progressive taxation working is when you know like basically we've already won. <laughs> you know, um, like I I don't know. Uh, I think I think like you know ideally um, there was there's this book. Um, called radical markets mm-hmm. um which is which is a good read um you should read it even though it's like liberal but it's like good liberal where they suggested this thing called um the uh, i think it was like the self-assessed property tax or something um mm-hmm. where the way it works is um like productive productive capital and land um 
the like everyone you pay like a, you know a, a, an annual tax on it, but that tax is chosen by you because you say that um, I will either pay like I don't know like five percent or whatever of a value that I think this is worth, or anyone can buy it off me. And I think I think that would be um, if it if it got implemented, I think that would be like really fantastic at. Um, at the very least, like eroding concentrations of wealth. Um, people are probably going to yell at me for being white about this, but <laughs> I think trying to like somehow undo all the past wrongs that you know are awful and very serious throughout history. I think I think that's like impossible, and I think you know there's like weird dangers of like certain nationalisms reemerging and stuff like that. Although, <clears throat> we'll expand on that. What do you, you know, mean? God, um, people are going to get so mad at me. Um, but I think I think like it kind of you know might devolve into like a really vulgar identity politics where what like might? you know people are like oh you know I've like you know one eight you know native Indian blood or something therefore uh, you know I deserve this I don't know like okay off the top of my head like I don't know like maybe like everyone who like you know has ever like been sent to a prison for like you know nonviolent drug offenses or something like that should like um own like the prisons or what or something like after the rev. <laughs> Anyone who grew up like in like a ghetto or you know in you know on like a, a Native American re- reservation or like you know because like these are like fucking awful like travesties and you know like it's a massive injustice. But um, ideally, what I would want is to, like get to a point where you know everyone is so wealthy that you know these things don't matter. And I think, um, but is this but I is think, that a like, gradual transition? So like, how, in other yeah, words, how do we take yeah. back what they've stolen from us? So that like. I think I think one really good thing about like market anarchist analysis is the current system is so inefficient that like if we were to get any approximating like a free society, all that shit wouldn't matter. You know, the current economy is like so dysfunctional and like just so about rent seeking that it just seems sort of absurd to like, you know, try and call for like this redistribution when, you know, like Nah, I, I don't want that. I, I want to unleash, you know, the cre- creative potential of everyone on Earth. I think that's like far more effective at getting like the wealth that we want. Now, of course, that like will not happen overnight and that like maybe isn't even guaranteed to happen. Um, and so like, what do we do between now and then? And then, you know, in, in that case, like something like a land value tax or something to um, like, like basically the way I see it is just try and tax as much as possible, like rent seekers and like negative externalities which is a lot so like there's a lot there what do you mean Um, by rent seekers you know like so like obvious stuff like people you know (laughs) yeah here's a really fucking good example like a land value tax like two birds with one stone one you know make like property prices go down which would be great and like two would also like you know make donald trump just like disappear (laughs) (laughs) like you would never see donald trump again which would be fantastic just today, I saw um, like University of California uh, was going to go open access um, before they published through like Elsevier, which is like if you, like if you know anything about like academic publishing, like Elsevier is just this comically like awful rent seeker where you know like they do like editing I think on articles and like they take like you know a massive cut and yeah they're just like fucking awful. Just getting like enough universities around the world to like you know just stop going through them that that'd be fantastic. But yeah, like so like the problem is is like addressing these problems. It's like obviously like anyone could like you know write up oh yeah here's like you know some relatively like robust policies that would like you know equalize the damage done to society. But like you know the question is like do you have the political capital to enact them and also you know mm-hmm. that process like it's so easy to be captured that yeah po- yeah i just don't trust it yeah the unintended um, consequences of it all so i'm so i'm so stuck with this because if we ended the state right mm-hmm. we might still be stuck with these huge power dynamics yeah. with again the uh ill-gotten gains by these yeah, by these yeah, monopolists yeah. in other yeah. words so i i don't know how to write that wrong Uh, i don't have a solution yeah i think it's possible that like counter economics may be able to play some Mm. role in that by sucking the beasts dry and just moving things Mm. more into the informal economy and just Mm. maybe we can't take back the ill-gotten gains of the past but we can stop the bleeding now yeah yeah so like i i just think like you know those ill-gotten gains are so complicated 
and like trying to undo them. I don't know. I think I guess you can sort of think about this instead of in in terms of like entropy, where like you know just trying to like reverse time, you know, is really complicated, and like trying to just figure out where everything went, it's just you know like impossible. Like, you just can't put together that pottery that smashed on the floor. It's just very difficult. I I would much rather just like my approach would be just you know like figure out the best way to like undermine the fact that you know they need more and more they need um you know intervention to maintain profitability and to maintain like functionality that's the way i would see it i i don't think like trying to you know fix everything um i think that's impossible unfortunately you know obviously like i'd like to do things like i don't know make, maybe give land back to people but even then like that's like really complicated because when you guys when like people came to america um settlers came to america like you know you, you guys had like like what like 10 percent of the population here or something or one percent like i don't know like maybe you know in 100 years like we can all like take off to the stars and the asteroids and we can leave like the primitivists here and That'll be great. But like in the meantime, like there are just realities about people have stuff there. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated. And um, yeah, there is also the potential for stuff to go wrong. But again, like this thing I keep on coming back to is um, market anarchist theory. It's like really, really, really strong about the fact that individuals bottom up organizing uh, positive sum like relations between individuals um, when like they, you know, trying to get stuff done. There are just the benefits are like fantastic and um, top down hierarchies, like they have to replicate that, you know, with like uh, this is way like individual agency and like, you know, really just like numb the capacity of people to think or, you know, like they just use outright threats. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, trying to like, I think, I think like focus on redistribution only in so far as like either we can get away with it or it like, you know, keeps you guys alive. Otherwise focus on, like building something better because mm -hmm. yeah, this is like, you know, this, this like current state of affairs is just not worth defending. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. I hear you. You mentioned Kevin Carson quite a bit so far in this interview. Mm. I was just wondering, do you think yeah. there's anything Kevin Carson gets wrong? <laughs> so like, I'm going to use, I'm going to quote, I can't remember who, I can't remember who said this, but I remember like uh, back, back in like 2006, I read like a um, review of like a game and they like they said like the only places that like you know fails or stumbles it's like areas that other people like aren't even trying um and that's kind of what i'd say about kevin carson although like that's not entirely like people are sort of catching up to him but like holy fucking like that dude is like decades ahead of everyone else it's insane i think one thing one issue of kevin carson <clears throat> is um his sources he like cites people from like a variety of backgrounds mm -hmm. so like he'll cite like you know really well-polished like academics um and not even like their books like you know like blogging and stuff and then like you know okay and then like you know if you like cite like people who you know have a less qualified and maybe know less about what they're talking about and so yeah i think that's sort of problematic and then also i think i, I think he underestimates like the capacity for new breakthroughs to recentralize stuff he like one obvious one that um i found out about was like um you know, he, he makes like some pretty good arguments about like, you know, decentralization and like moving back to like, you know, more localized production. And I think those arguments like really good. But like, you know, there are certain technologies where that isn't really so much the case and you do actually benefit from economies of scale. I think um, like the microchip industry mm -hmm. um, requires massive capital outlays. Although, I don't know, like maybe it is possible to, you know, sort of like, e like you can still like break it up into like, you know, individual workshops that are all like negotiating with each other but like 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 part of the problem again um is that like there just aren't enough eyeballs on this stuff and so you know like we don't know again like where sort of stuff breaks down but i feel like kevin carson like he's got this incredibly solid um central critique and then there's like you know weird edge cases where like maybe it's sort of questionable and then even then like you know we just need to like like maybe if, you know, research took a different path, like back in the day, like that wouldn't be the case. Maybe there's ways to cent decentralize it. So that's, that's one problem with Kevin Carson. I, I think the um, other problem with him is um, I think he could like try and, because uh, I, I think I read somewhere like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't like math, which fair enough. I don't like math either. Mm. But I think um, one thing that he'd benefit from was like trying to like explicitly state things, you know, like create like 
rules about stuff that like, you know, cause so like, you know, in all of his, in all of his work, you can kind of get like formal rules from what he, from what he writes, but like he doesn't explicitly say it. And mm-hmm. I think, um, I think like, again, going back to the problem of like edge cases, I think it would be much easier to find those edge cases if like, you know, he was like, okay, here is like a rule or a hypothesis um, that I've got from, you know, compiling all this stuff. <laughs> and then, and then from there we can like, you know, figure out where it works and where it doesn't. But also, you know, um, like, um, his latest book, the desktop regulatory state, mm-hmm. um, I think would have like benefited real, I like benefited a lot from like discussions about like game theory and like stuff like that, which, you know, um, he draws on Eleanor Ostrom in that book and, you know, her classic governing the commons the very first chapter of that is like here is my uh abstract analysis of how this works game theoretically and then from there on there on i'm gonna you know look at actual practical examples of this so yeah i think um i think you'd benefit in that regard yeah then empiricism always helps cool so uh is there anything within anarchism that you think is under theorized oh gee um yeah, I think I think like more broadly, um, I would like to see you know um, like the shedding of like yeah the baggage of the left because that's super you know that's super problematic. But you know I think like you know people have been talking about that since like the nineties at least. So right. you know like whatever. I think um, actually yeah I think I think one thing that'd be interesting would be um, like explicit analysis of social capital, like especially online. You know, there's like, like, it, there's like a lot of people like talking about this sort of stuff, but like nobody's like written like a formal analysis. Um, and so there's like no, there's no like literature that people can refer to. And that's something like I'm like really, like I'd find like super fascinating. It's like a space that I find like very difficult to navigate and think about just because like, uh, it's like, it's just so like intuitive to me how things sort of, so work in a certain way. And mm-hmm. it's hard to see how they'd be different. I think I think analysis of that is super interesting. You were saying you had you would have a hard time seeing how that would be different. What what were you comparing? I I don't know, like you know, just like tw- like Twitter mobs and stuff, um, and you know, like call out culture. Obviously, it's like a problem, but like I don't know. I I, I yeah I, I I guess yeah, I could see how that would be different. Um. I, I, but also, you know, like people talking about, you know, like, oh yeah, like this guy has like a lot of status in a group. And so, you know, they can get away with like bad stuff or, you know, they can like, they have more influence and, you know, that might, might, you know, that, that might be problematic. And so like stuff like that is all like, you know, obviously that's a concern. It's just, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's another question entirely. And that's something like, I really just don't know. I just don't know how to, I just yeah. don't know like where to go. Yeah, that would be nice to to see someone sort of expound on that a little bit. Yeah. That's that's a that's and then a, also, that's a good example. And then also um an analysis of how um I and this, you know, isn't just confined to anarchism, but this is something I'd like to just see analysis on. An analysis of how like the structure of um social media results in certain like behavioral outcomes. I think that that's like something that if I was like in university and like a sociology student or something, like that'd be something I'd really want to test out, you know, like, um, I don't know, like get like 150 people or something to, you know, like try out a sandboxed app and, you know, like tinker around with how like social interaction works and see like what comes out, what the experience is like and what like things are incentivized on those platforms. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I think it's super useful. Yeah, I think I think stuff around that is like I think I think it'd be like legitimately world changing to have like again this goes back to like collective action problems um, to have like better tools for communication. I it's it's again it's like really hard to notice because you know um, it's like infrastructure like infrastructure is really good when it's invisible like you don't notice it and um, like these these platforms we use like they aren't. Well, you know, they're, they're good and bad. Like, if they were just completely bad, we wouldn't use them. But um, the the underlying dynamics 
tend to be invisible to us. And I'm not even talking about like Cambridge Analyt- Anal- Analytica shit where like, you know, like people are like, oh, you know, like they're going to mind control you. And I'm like, no, they're, you know, like, they're just like, you know, better than like what we had before where like, you know, we could find people who had certain like personality traits. Um, and then, you know, you give them advertising and then, you know, they'll vote Trump because, you know, like it's 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 not magical like they're just you know slightly better at finding these people i think i think like analysis of how like these platforms at like a deep level shape us um and you know like there's, there's precedent for that um ian banks in um the culture series um one of the ideas he plays around with is like um the language that they use was um artificially made to you know be like you know like to, to like promote the values that they have so you know it's like it's about like caring and like openness and understanding and stuff and i think i think there's like a similar thing with like the media tools we use like i don't think it's like as like reductionist as like oh yeah like they're made by capitalists ergo they have capitalist value values um but i think like the dynamics of how they work definitely shape like how people act on them and they like like statistically you know they incline people to act in certain ways you know they can it can obviously be be resisted but like just habit and laziness means that like you might act a certain way um because of like the way it's set up i think that's i think there's like a lot of potential there super interesting but again like i don't know anyone who's doing it and i don't like have the resources to do so so if you do please like contact me I'd, i'd really be fascinated to see what you're doing or you know if there's already existing research on this yeah it'd be fascinating please hit me up yeah yeah that would be interesting well speaking of social media what are your thoughts on the media landscape in general especially with the recent rise of the left on youtube (laughs) oh i'm i'm yeah this is this is my favorite question no um I think I think it's super interesting. I think that ContraPoints, Natalie Wynn, who's um this sort of social justice YouTuber who, you know, like very aesthetic aesthetic, very like uh, eye catching videos. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping she's so like she's got like fairly high production values and so I'm hoping she's part of like a more general trend towards just like explicitly political content that, you know, is both entertaining and politically savvy. I think there's like good reason to believe that this might be po- possible. Political radicals of you know pretty much all stripes throughout the 20th century, if they were like creative types, one area that they kind of converged on um, was like fiction writing, mm-hmm. um, because like you know you can tell fairly like expansive, interesting stories, and you don't need like that much in terms of like startup capital to make it happen. So like obviously con- contrast that to like you know. Uh, television or movies um, where, you know, you do need, like, serious investments to make something that, like, is popular. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite a bit more expensive to, like, you know, reach that level of quality. So, like, ContraPoint, she just does videos on um, philosophical t- subjects. Um, but what I'm hoping is that, like, people start expanding out to, like, stuff like um, pure sort of entertainment. So, like, um, what I'd really like to see is, you know, like, a left-wing YouTuber or, you know, an anarchist YouTuber or whatever, I don't know, like, try to put together, like, a piece of fiction. And the reason why I think this would be possible is, um, like, the the costs of, what, of what's involved. So stuff like editing software, um, like, costumes, like, cameras and stuff like that, that's all, like, collapsed in price. Um, and also the distribution mechanism, you know, YouTube obviously isn't perfect, but it's considerably it's considerably better than what than what we've had before and so i think i think there's a potential and like you know if you look at all like the best like left-wing youtubers they're all like like they, they all have like artistic backgrounds and you're like they're actors and shit yeah i think i think there's like a potential for you know like you know they stop doing videos on like oh you know here's how you know like corporations and video games make it bad and like they start you know like <laughs> actually making i don't know i i imagine be like short skits or you know like short films about you know workers struggle or something um you know obviously you know most of them are like really boring social democrats who are marxists which you know kind of sucks but i think i think like there's there's a capacity especially especially like if we were to get things like you know basic income or even you know like a basic needs infrastructure where like people no longer had to work as much I think there's like a capacity for like, um, like an artistic 
kind of flowering that makes like the 1960s, you know, look like the mid two mid like the mid 2000s or something. Yeah, because I've spoken to like these people online who you know are like these you know really savvy like artists or academics or something who you know just have to work all the time and like they can't you know like they're they're like creative and they've got talent but they just like can't put in the time and they don't have the money to like like make what they want to make and i think like giving them the space to do that i think i think you'd see like some really really cool shit and um i think i think just like also like politically speaking in terms of propaganda i think it'd be like incredibly effective well, it'd be great if we so, could convince a lot of these people to be anarchists also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, that's, that's the other thing. Like, there's, like, a lot of, like, Marxist-influenced artists, but there's also, like, a lot of anarchist-influenced artists. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. And, and, you know, like, we're better um, because, you know, they're <laughs> like, oh, we're going to do a thing about, like, the struggle of a noble worker. And we're like, no, we're just going to, you know, throw a brick through a factory window and then... <laughs> <laughs> and then abolish work. Yeah, no, um... Yeah, like, like honestly, as, and the other thing is, like, anarchists are probably also, like, guilty of this, but, like, I, so I've, like, seen, like, Marxists in, like, comment threads be like, wow, you know, like, self-publishing is, like, a thing. Like, you can do that. Oh, man, this is, like, I should, I should start doing that. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I think the fact that, like, anarchists are not as, we're not as attached to, like, academia, and we're not as, hopefully, as attached to, like, formal organizations, and, uh, and so I think, like, in this space that could give us like the ability to outmaneuver them because you know they're like oh you know um we got to go through like academia because you know that's how we're gonna like that's what everyone else does and you know that's how i'm gonna i don't know like get status among people who like i respect and stuff whereas um i think i think um anarchists and have a much more adversarial relationship with academia, which I think mm-hmm. is really good. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying like, don't go into academia, um, right. Jason Lee bias, yeah. but like, um, <laughs> no, um, I just, I just think like we have a much stronger critique of it. I think mean, that's much more healthy. Oh, like obviously, you know, like you can do useful stuff in academia, but I think also we recognize the limitations. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, we have like this critique of credentialism and um you know like managerial managerialism which you know some marxists have but like it's sort of iffy and um there's a there's a tension there that we don't have thankfully so yeah i think i think there's like i think there's a lot of potential there i'm really excited yeah um, totally for, like, expanding that space. yeah um it's weird how the new left sort of was absorbed into academia and on one hand i want to say Like anarchists should avoid that at all costs. But in the other hand, it's like you see the effect that the university has had on society in large, probably for the worse, maybe Mm. for the better in some some cases. Um, Yeah. But if a lot of it, and so on the other hand, it's like if a lot of anarchists did join academia, I could see like a possible positive cultural effect that that we could have. But at the same time, we shouldn't retire yeah. to that necessarily and always explore a diversity yeah. of tactics. I mean, in terms of just strategy, I just don't see like academia, like maybe that would have been the case a couple of decades ago. But like nowadays, I think academia, like, first of all, it's like losing legitimacy, which is both good and bad. And then second, it's, um, you know, it's days are numbered. Like, I agree. It, yeah, it's like trying to take something over when, you know, it's like going to die. Critical support to, you know, David Graeber. You know, hope he keeps on publishing stuff, but like, yeah, um, I just, I just don't see it as like a place worth contesting. Sure. Yeah. Man, lots of, lots of shout outs to David Graeber and uh, Kevin Carson on this podcast so far. Everyone's really liked them, but all right. So, so let's move on. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to list some things. I got one more question after this and then I'll let you go. I'm going to list some things and I'd like for you to respond to each one of the items in one minute or less. Feel free to pass if you don't have an opinion on the thing that I list. Are you down? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Okay, cool. Nietzsche. Uh, yeah, it's all right. I don't know. Uh, I think I mean, he's like sort of inconsistent. And I think he's open to a lot of interpretations, which I think was his point. But um, the German state, um, I think, was like handing out copies of like Thus Spike Zarathustra to like its soldiers <laughs> in the trenches of World War One, And like, if you've ever read that, it's, you know, very like flowery and sort of complicated, except for like this one chapter where he's like, oh yeah, like the state is like really shitty. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which is, you know, hilarious. And I don't know. I, I, I had my existentialist phase when I was like, you know, like 16 or something. And I've grown out of it now. And I don't know. I just, I just find it all like a bit like boring. And, you know, it's, it's great to like freak out about like meaning and purpose. And then once you get older, you're like, oh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, well, no, I don't think that's true for everyone. But like, I, I feel much more secure in terms of like, life purpose and stuff like that than I did when I was that age. So yeah, it just doesn't hold as much value for me anymore. Um, which I think Nietzsche was like, he was into that sort of thing. So yeah, he's, he's like fun to quote, but you know, so are a lot of people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Queer theory. Um, I mean like basically correct. I, I don't, I don't, I haven't like read like any queer theory. So I, I have no idea, but you know, like gender is a spook, and if you would disagree, like <laughs> you just get wrecked. I think it'd be really interesting to see like correlations between like conforming to gender roles and like intellectual like openness and openness to like new ideas and like you know trying to be accurate about stuff. My like my ultimate dream would you know be to like troll like Jordan Peterson supporters by being like, oh, you know, like super intelligent AI is like going to be transgender. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's gonna be like a transgender cat girl and it's gonna like maximize head pats um <laughs> that'd be that'd be super funny um someone should write that as a short story <laughs> nice okay cool. yeah bernie sanders um i mean he like basically revived the left but i don't know how good of a thing that is so yeah i think bernie sanders is like for better or worse it's like the success of occupy I think, I think the fact that, you know, so many millennials are like, oh, you know, socialism, um, that word is like not scary to me anymore. I think is like the direct result of Occupy. And I think people try and down, downplay it because they don't want the idea that autonomous social groups can achieve things. But I, I think I think it was pretty effective in that regard. And so, you know, they should see Bernie Sanders for better or worse and his popularity as a sign of success. Myers-Briggs. Um, it's dumb. <laughs> I don't like, I don't like personality shit. I, I hate it. I, I, I hate it. Cause like, I'm always like, you know, when I feel like shit and I take one of those tests, like, you know, I'm very different from when I, you know, feel all right. And I take one of those tests. And so that is yeah. exactly I think, what um, an INTJ would say. Uh, well, I guess I'm <laughs> yeah, just that. all right, cool. Um, I, I think that means, um, from like, I was on Reddit once and I think that means like, I'm like a one, I'm like in like the 1% and like my average salary is like six figures. Oh um, shit. That's cool. I, I, yeah. Um, I think like the big five, that's more accurate. Although even then dude, like personality is like a spook and, um, yeah, it's, it's just like dumb. It's just like shit that people are like, Oh, I'm going to like optimize my workplace by like getting these people who are like good together to do stuff and like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um yeah i i'm i'm really not a fan like I'm, I'm sure it matters but i think i think those things are like more variable than people think and like even if they aren't variable more variable like i i don't want to live in a world where like people have these static personalities i think this is something that we should act actively fight to like you know people should be able to change so i i just don't like them <laughs> okay fair enough all right, so last question, and then mm. we'll uh, we'll move on to the yeah. to the end of the the conversation. Yeah. So obviously, anarchism is more than just simply an end goal. It's something we can do every day. Uh, yeah. But nonetheless, we're striving to move beyond power dynamics that dominate society. Mm. So yeah. two of the more obvious ones are two that we've talked about in this conversation, which is the state and capitalism. So for my last question, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the best tactics, in your opinion, for undermining or abolishing the state and capitalism? I, so I think, I mean, right now, like so much of it is, you look at the statistics and it's like, um, like I think like 40% of like the United States GDP, like reflected in like intellectual property in some regard. Um, I think there's a similar statistic for Europe, although I might be wrong about that. I think, I think like, rent seeking nowadays is like the main way wealth is extracted and so i think anything anything you can do to undermine that and i think the dynamics have changed a lot around that um before you know like it was the factories that was the place um nowadays it's like outside the factories that, that's what matters so you've got this formal process be it intellectual property or credentialing where like barriers are set up 
um, and you know people can extract rent. And I think any way you can get around those barriers is good. I think a really good example um, is the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective, who are mm. like a bunch of um, they're like they're like a bunch of like renegade like chemists and stuff, and they're like Michael, trying to make. Um, I, I plan on interviewing the the speaker. Oh, of that. Yeah, no, yeah, no. That I hung out like, with him the other day, is, actually. Michael is such a Michael is such a fucking badass. He sure is. Um, he sure is. Yeah, but just the fact that, like there's a like a massive markup on like pretty much everything. You know, just pick something and then like you know figure out a way to like make it like get ways to like you know get that thing without having to deal with the markup. Yeah, I you know there's like a whole a whole bunch of other stuff, but um I think I think like that's just like the easiest way. And I think because we have the ability to share information so easily, once someone finds a way, that that method can be like propagated like everywhere very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, if all you're looking for is um, return on investment in terms of action, in terms of like what you have to do and what you get out of it, I think that's like the most effective way. And and also like there's just so much stuff. The space for like maneuvering is gigantic. And mm-hmm. um, the, yeah, there's just a lot of like low hanging fruit, as it were. And you know that, that like I don't want to like make it sound easy. It's not. There are risks involved, but it's weird. I think like there's never been a time in history where the potential for individuals to do things that you know actually really reshape the world. I don't think there's like been a better time for it. And that that's terrifying because it also means like fucking like incel weirdos can like print you know like super viruses that Mm. can like kill all women in like i don't know like a decade or something Mm -hmm. um and that's fucking terrifying but like at the same time you know like there's also a lot of potential for good um you know you've just got to go for like that and you've got to like try and break stuff down and yeah the um the the dynamics are really are, are in our favor more than they've, they've ever been it's just that like no one's aware of that and so you've got dipshit people like the dsa like trying to do dipshit tactics that are outdated unfortunately but one thing about this is like a couple of successes and then people will start paying attention and you know that means more people working and that's good so yeah that's that's what i'd go with yeah okay cool well is there anything i forgot to ask you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview um everyone everyone should go follow um this reactionary called true diltom who is also an australian is like my evil twin he's like a neo-absolutist he went from like conservative libertarian to like like monarchist like weirdo um and i i would say he's worth listening to just because he's like the most coherent fascist alive today um he, he really just like boils things down to um, just like this really like simple and easy to digest like vision of fascism. And I think, yeah, he's, he's worth listening to just because he's like the complete opposite of my politics and he's like actually coherent and he's like not fucking around like Richard Spencer where like, he's like, Oh, you know, like I, I'm not actually like a Nazi, like, you know, peaceful removal. Um, no, this guy's, this guy's like very honest and that's good. And he's worth listening to because I think like in like a year, he's going to be advocating for like planned economies um, despite like coming out of libertarianism because he's like catching on to the fact that like markets are not his friend. So yeah, yeah, um, you should, you should listen to him. (laughs) Weird advice. Okay. You know, something on that note, actually, Hans, I I said a long time ago that the alt-right was eventually going to be calling for gun control. And guess what, my friend? Hans Hermann Hoppe at least hinted at it in one of his speeches when he was talking about the connections between libertarianism and the alt-right. Oh, that is that is beautiful. Yeah, no. um, Yeah, I'm I'm thinking of um, going undercover and like writing like a near distributist manifesto for like some alt-right publication just because like i want you know marxists to start freaking out when like these traditionalists are like oh yeah we need planned economies to like you know keep the degenerates out <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord so, yeah. okay okay it's, it's gonna rule it's gonna rule so much <laughs> well we gotta we gotta fuck them up one way or the other right yeah no um yeah, no. So, like, the future is like free market communism versus like planned <laughs> state communism. Straight up. <laughs> All right. Well, where can people go to follow you to uh, read some of your articles and just to oh, yeah. s- see your uh, daily happenings? 
Oh yeah, no. Um, so I'm on I'm on Twitter at um mutual underscore aid. That's a y y d e at Twitter. Uh, and then also I publish at the Center for a Stateless Society. That's c4ss.org. And um, I'm not currently like an author there, although I I'm I'm looking to publish one article a month there. So you know maybe by the end of this year I'll be an author. Um, but yeah, if you just like type in mutual aid c4ss i should come up no um sorry uh c4ss.org frank miroslav okay all right cool all right the soy enthusiast the happy cuckold (laughs) the admirer of jewish pornography oh yeah mutual aid (laughs) and that's mutual underscore a y y d e follow them on twitter and check out their articles on c4ss they're fucking dope Thank you so much, Frank, for doing this. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Frank Miroslav. Make sure to read their work at c4ss.org and follow them on Twitter. If you like this episode and want to check out the rest of my conversations, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud pages. You can help the show by liking and sharing these videos on social media. And if you're interested in helping financially, I'd be eternally grateful. To do that, visit our Patreon account at patreon.com slash Media. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. We'll talk to you soon.